So, as we discussed previously, many of the biological processes that exist in nature, for example, in the cells of our body, are catalyzed by enzymes. So, enzymes speed up the rates of chemical reactions, and that essentially produces the same amount of product as without the enzyme, but it produces that product at a much higher rate. Now, the thing about that is, we don't always want to produce some given product at a high rate. Sometimes, we want to basically stop the production of a product because simply we have too much of that product inside our cell or inside the environment in the first place. And so what that means is, for the biological system, such as our cells, to actually function effectively and efficiently, they have to have a way of actually controlling and regulating the activity and the functionality of enzymes. And one way by which we can actually control the activity of enzymes is by using these special molecules, and in some cases ions, to basically inhibit the activity of these enzymes, and these are known as enzymatic inhibitors. So once again, in order to function effectively, biological systems must be able to regulate and control the activity and the functionality of enzymes. Special agents we call inhibitors can bind onto enzymes and inhibit or block their activity. So there are two categories of inhibitors. We have irreversible inhibitors and we have reversible inhibitors. So let's begin by briefly focusing on irreversible inhibitors. So in irreversible inhibition, that particular inhibitor basically binds onto the enzyme very tightly, very strongly. It binds so strongly that it's very unlikely that it's ever going to actually dissociate from that enzyme. So if we take a look in the following chemical reaction, we have the enzyme and our irreversible inhibitor. And so because this is attracted very strongly to that enzyme, it will bind onto that enzyme forming this product, this enzyme inhibitor complex. And notice the arrow is much longer going this way than this way. And what that means is the binding is essentially irreversible. The equilibrium lies very far to the right side of this chemical reaction. Now, the majority of the time when this binding takes place between the irreversible inhibitor and the enzyme, the binding is via covalent bonds. But sometimes we can also have non-covalent bonds. So some inhibitors will bind to enzymes very tightly, either by covalent or non-covalent means. And once bound, they will not dissociate very easily from the enzyme. And these inhibitors are known as irreversible inhibitors. They have a very high affinity for the enzyme. So one very common misconception about irreversible inhibition is that these inhibitors always bind covalently by forming covalent bonds between the enzyme and the inhibitor. And that is simply not true. There are examples of molecules that inhibit irreversibly and yet they only form non-covalent bonds. So remember that. The underlining, the defining point about irreversible inhibitors is that they bind very strongly and so they will not let go of that enzyme very easily. That is what defines irreversible inhibition. And once they bind, they change the conformation and so they essentially inhibit or block the activity of that enzyme. Now, there are many different examples of irreversible inhibitors and three examples are listed on the board. So we have nerve gas, we have penicillin, and we have aspirin. And each one of these molecules basically binds to inhibits a specific type of enzyme found inside our body. So let's begin with nerve gas. Nerve gas is a very dangerous, very potent, irreversible inhibitor and it forms covalent bonds. It binds onto a special enzyme found inside the nervous system known as acetylcholinesterase. So remember, acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that breaks down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine that is used to basically communicate between nerve cells. And so by binding onto that enzyme, onto the acetylcholinesterase, 
acetylcholinesterase, it inhibits that enzyme from breaking down that neurotransmitter. And that essentially leads to the breakdown of the nervous system and that leads to death of that particular individual. Now, what about penicillin? So nerve gas kills off that individual, but penicillin actually saves that individual because for example, if an individual uh, has an infection by some, uh, some type of bacterial agent, if we add penicillin into that individual, what penicillin does is it binds onto a special enzyme found in that bacterial cell that essentially is used by the bacterial cell to form the bacteria cell wall. So that enzyme is known as transpeptidase. So transpeptidase is an enzyme used by the bacterial cell to form the wall, the cell wall around that bacterial cell. And penicillin binds onto transpeptidase and prevents it, inactivates it, inhibits it, and prevents it from making that cell wall. And so the bacterial cell eventually dies off. Now, what about aspirin? Well, aspirin is once again an irreversible inhibitor that binds onto a special enzyme known as cyclooxy, uh, cyclooxygenase. So, aspirin binds onto cyclooxygenase and it prevents that molecule from essentially stimulating the process of inflammation. And so that decreases pain, it, it basically makes headaches go away, and so forth. And each one of these are irreversible inhibitors that modify the enzyme by binding covalently to that enzyme. Now, let's move on to reversible inhibitors. So, in reversible inhibition, we have these inhibitors that bind onto the enzyme, but they bind relatively weakly, and that means reversibly. So, we can easily change the conditions in the environment, and that will essentially cause the dissociation of that inhibitor from that particular enzyme. So, the defining property of reversible inhibition is the ease with which which the inhibitors can actually dissociate and break away from the enzyme under certain condition. And this is in contrast to irreversible inhibitors that basically bind onto the enzyme and once bound, they will not dissociate very easily. Now, we can subdivide, subcategorize reversible inhibition into three different types. And actually, there are four, but in this lecture, we're going to focus on three. So we have competitive inhibition, we have uncompetitive inhibition, and we have non-competitive inhibition. We also have something called mixed inhibition, but we're not going to focus on that in this lecture. So let's begin with competitive inhibition. So what exactly do we mean by competitive inhibition? Well, in some cases, we have an inhibitor that actually resembles the substrate that binds onto the active side. And so what that means is the structure of that inhibitor is similar to the structure of that particular substrate. And because the structure resembles, what that means is that inhibitor will bind to the same location where the substrate actually binds to. And so that's exactly why that inhibitor will compete with the substrate for that active site. And we see in competitive inhibition that inhibitor binds onto that same active site that the substrate actually binds to. So, in this inhibition, the inhibitor molecule typically resembles that substrate and can therefore bind into the active site of that enzyme. And once bound, the inhibitor prevents that substrate from actually occupying that active site. Now, what competitive inhibition does, and we'll discuss this in much more detail in the next lecture, is it keeps the Vmax the same, so it keeps the maximum velocity of that enzyme the same, but it increases the parent Km value. It increases the Michaelis constant. And we'll see exactly what that means and why, to, and why that's the case in the next lecture. So let's take a look at the following diagram. So we have the enzyme shown in blue. This is the active side of the enzyme. This is the inhibitor and this is the substrate. And notice that they are very similar in their structure. And that's precisely why when we mix these three molecules, that inhibitor will bind onto the active side forming the enzyme inhibitor mixture. 
And so this substrate will not bind onto that active site simply because there is no space to actually go into that active site. Now, the question that you might ask is, why is it that the red molecule, the inhibitor, binds into the active site and not the green molecule, the substrate? Well, because normally the affinity of that inhibitor for that active site is much higher than the affinity of that substrate. And that's exactly why, if given the chance to, if we mix these three molecules, because this has a much higher affinity for the active site than the substrate, this will be much more likely to actually bind into that active site to form that enzyme inhibitor mixture, enzyme inhibitor complex. Now, the defining point about competitive inhibition that you should know is because that inhibitor binds into the active side, the same region where the substrate actually binds to, we can actually kick off that inhibitor from the active side by increasing the concentration of the substrate. And that's because when we increase the number of the green substrate molecules, there is much higher mathematical probability chance that the substrate will essentially collide with the active side and go into that active side. So by increasing the concentration of the green molecules, we increase the likelihood that the green molecules will collide with the active side to form the enzyme substrate complex. And that's exactly why if we increase the concentration of the substrate, those green molecules will eventually outcompete these red inhibitor molecules and that will bring back the velocity of that um, the velocity or the rate of that enzyme back to its normal value so once again, competitive, inhib uh, competitive inhibitors typically have a much higher affinity for the active side than natural substrate molecules. However, if we increase the concentration of the substrate, the additional substrate can outcompete the inhibitor for the active site, therefore increasing the substrate concentration can remove the effect of that competitive inhibitor that it has on that enzyme. And this is only true in competitive inhibition. It is not true in uncompetitive and it is not true in non-competitive. So if you're given a problem and you are told that by increasing the concentration you essentially remove that effect, you should know that 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 is competitive inhibition. Now, what's one example of a molecule that acts as an inhibitor in the competitive inhibition fashion? Well, inside our body, the cells have to be able to synthesize purine molecules and pyrimidine molecules because these are the molecules that are basically used to produce DNA molecules. Now, one important enzyme in the biosynthesis of purines and pyrimidines is known as dihydrofolate reductase, and the substrate to this enzyme is dihydrofolate. Now, we also have this molecule known as methotrexate, and methotrexate is a competitive inhibitor to this substrate, to this enzyme here. In fact, methotrexate is about 1,000 times more likely to actually bind onto the active side of dihydrofolate reductase than dihydrofolate itself. And so that's exactly why it will be much more likely to bind to the active side than the substrate. But if we increase the concentration of the substrate, that will essentially outcompete that inhibitor for the active side and that will bring back the rate of the enzyme back to normal. Now, let's move on to uncompetitive inhibition. Well, in some cases, we see that when that substrate actually binds onto the active site of the enzyme, once the binding takes place, it creates conformational changes. And sometimes in some enzymes, that conformational change actually creates a brand new pocket, a brand new region of space that can now bind some type of inhibitor molecule. And that inhibitor molecule can now bind into the space to form the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. And once this complex is formed, that will essentially inhibit or block the activity of that enzyme. And this type of inhibition is known as 
uncompetitive inhibition. So in some cases, the binding of the substrate to the active site changes the conformation of the enzyme and creates a brand new pocket we call an allosteric site that was not previously there. And this pocket is only created when the green substrate binds into the pocket of this blue enzyme. So before the binding took place, we did not have that allosteric site. But once the binding takes place, we create this pocket, the crevice, that can now bind some type of inhibitor molecule. And if that red inhibitor molecule is in, uh, is in close proximity, it can bind onto that pocket, and once it binds, it forms the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex. And notice that once the bound, once the inhibitor is bound, it will basically prevent that green structure from exiting that active site and that will ultimately prevent that product from actually being formed. Now, as we'll see in the next lecture, and again, we'll discuss this in much more detail and we'll see why this is the case. In uncompetitive inhibition, the V 